Welcome to Peterborough Matters. Um, a little bit of a different format uh, through this pandemic, um, something that's new, um, but uh, your TV is uh, on the cutting edge, I guess you might say, in terms of uh, <laughs> attempting this. And uh, I have my uh, your TV mug, so it's almost, almost like being at the studio. Um, and of course, I also have with me, as we do uh, all the time, uh, Mayor Diane Terrian. How are you doing, Diane? I'm good. I don't. I have my matching blazer mug, not my ER TV one. So I, very I'll know that for next week. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'd like to say there's tons of things to talk about, and there probably is. Uh, but of course, one thing that's just dominating our lives, our attention, uh, in so many different different ways, of course, is the COVID nineteen pandemic and the effect, uh, particularly on the Peterborough city county area. Um, you're on the front lines of that as the head of the municipality. I, I, I guess maybe a good place to start before we get into some particulars is how are you doing? And, uh, and, I, and I guess um, this is kind of unprecedented. No one could have seen this coming when you signed on for the job <laughs> in 2018, right? Yeah, it wasn't in my policy document, so that's for sure. Um, yeah, thank you for asking. I'm, I'm, do, I'm doing well. Um, you know, it's been uh, st stressful and there's been a lot of moving parts. Uh, you know, it, there's it's entirely unpredictable. And so every day is kind of the same, but also kind of different. And um, I mean, at the city, we, you know, are sort of past the point of, uh, you know, in March, it was declaring a state of emergency and closing down facilities and how are we going to operate the shelter and transit and and so now we've been for a couple of weeks uh, at a point where we've sort of made those decisions and, and sort of leaned into that routine. So there's a bit of, um, I don't know if I want to say stability or normalcy to how we're uh, operating things there, recognizing that things are changing still day by day. And just yesterday we got, you know, the, um, we heard from the province about their plans to reopen, which again, doesn't have any firm dates, but just talks about these two and four week intervals. So, um, so yeah, it's uh, certainly uh, unprecedented and not something that uh, anybody was prepared for. Um, but we're, I think we're doing a good job managing in terms of, you know, at the city, city staff and, and council um, responding to and preparing for the other side of this as well. And, and it's, uh, I don't think it's really lost on anybody, or it shouldn't be, that uh, well before the pandemic kind of broke and we we're in this situation, uh, the provincial government was looking at potentially, uh, you know, reducing public health care or services here in the Peterborough area. Could you imagine right now, Diane, if, uh, if we didn't have that team down on King Street doing what they do? Yeah, I mean, I'm very glad that uh, that we have our Peterborough Public Health uh, units and the health units across the province that have been doing great work and keeping the community up up to date and doing all of their um, they're doing all their other work too behind the scenes that we don't always hear about. Uh, but then they've also, particular Chief Medical Officer of Health, um, has just really put 150 percent into responding to this crisis, keeping the community up to date. Um, being ahead of the curve on a lot of the best practices. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's a real lesson in terms of how local health care, you know, is so vitally important to the needs of individual communities. Because if we were, you know, um, folded in with Durham region or some, you know, or the Eastern region, including Ottawa, like those kinds of things, it would be a very different scenario. So we're very fortunate that, that we haven't had any of that happen yet. And hopefully Absolutely. doesn't happen now going forward. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I've said to more than one person, and I think there's some validity to it, um, in terms of challenges that this municipality has faced, um, I mean, you can go back over the decades, uh, as far back as the Quaker fire in 1916, uh, more recently the flood, um, which devastated the city uh, uh, 2004, I believe, or in and around yeah. that time. Um, just in terms of challenges, that, like I really think this is, you use the word unprecedented, but I, I don't think there's any mayor or council that has really faced something this dire um, over such a long period of time as we're currently facing right now. And uh, and that that's pretty daunting. Uh, it's, it's like 
it's like every decision, it's almost like a World Series game where every at bat <laughs> becomes so important. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's like where, where every decision becomes so important and, and every comment and every statement and you're really under a microscope and uh, produces a lot of pressure. Oh yeah, for sure. And I mean, it's been an interesting, uh, you know, because there's been so many decisions that we've needed to make on the fly. And so I know last night at council, there was discussion about, you know, how in this, you know, pandemic state, they're having, you know, some of the decisions around closing facilities and that didn't, and they don't require council approval, but they didn't necessarily, like council didn't necessarily know. And we didn't necessarily know, you know, until the day of that we were going to do yeah. this. And it, that's the same across not just the province, but the country. And um, we've seen that from the, the provincial and federal governments too, because it is so unpredictable. You do need to just be very nimble and be able to react and adapt to the situation on any given day. Um, and so, you know, it is, you know, we're trying to, again, you know, have some sense of normalcy in terms of having our, our council and committee meetings and still running the business of the city, mm -hmm. but recognizing that the pandemic is sort of looming over all of those decisions and is gonna impact how we operate going forward. And we're gonna see more about that um, in May when we have a report coming forward that's gonna have some preliminary estimates about the financial impact um, the pandemic has had on the city. So it's gonna to be tough for sure. We had a tough budget year last year with a lot of the different downloads and, and you know different issues that were going on. And we're gonna see it probably even worse this year because we've lost a lot of revenue and um, mm -hmm. and everybody's struggling in it throughout the community. And you bring up a good point. At the end of the day, the goal of any elected body, be it federal, provincial, municipal, is the prosperity of, of the constituents, or the residents that they represent. And uh, I mean, there, there, there are so many unknowns of what's gonna happen go for, going forward. And, uh, and uh, I don't wanna use the word frightening because that's fear mongering, but it, it is a little scary, uh, like what kind of economy Peterborough, we're going to see locally, you know, comes when this is all said and done, hopefully sooner than better. What what are we going to be left with? And uh, and that that's you know that's something to ponder for sure. Yeah, I mean, anytime that you have uncertainty uh, is is scary. Uh, that's just the nature of not really knowing what's coming around the corner. Um, and so I think you know, without sort of fear mongering, a lot of people are frightened about what is coming because none of none of us know and it's impossible to predict. I mean, we know that uh, a lot of businesses have been hit really hard. There are some that have managed to adapt and there are some that in fact are, are doing quite well, but the majority uh, are really struggling. And so there's been talk about, you know, and again, this isn't just tied to Peterborough City County. This is tied to the uh, provincial, the national, the international economy. Uh, and so there have been discussions about, you know, the recession, depression, what is that going to look like? How are we going to, you know, climb out of it? Um, and we've had those discussions a little bit, like at council last night, we talked about the economic, the mayor and warden's economic recovery task force. Uh, I'm also, we're also working at, with city council to have an environmental and social uh, task forces because Again, when we come out the other side, our economy is going to look different than it has for the last 10 or 20 years. And so how can we make sure that we're positioning Peterborough to be uh, sustainable, resilient, uh, to be adaptable um, into what things are going to look like going forward? Because I think we're at a very critical point in terms of those policy decisions about how we work, how we interact, how we function as a not just an economic community, but as a social, as a human community. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's, um, there is opportunity there as much as there's challenges. You know, we are at a really critical point for deciding how we want to work going forward, how, you know, we want to, you know, where we want to put our focus as a community. So, um, so that's going to be really interesting. And I know that, um, it, you know, it's going to be hard. And there are, and again, businesses are struggling and workers have been laid off and people are having a really hard time. Never mind the fact that, you know, there's mental health issues compounded by having to sort of stay at home and not be able to see friends and family. So all of these things are intertwined, which is why we also want to look at the social piece of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but I think uh, I've had good conversations with uh, 
you know, our county representatives, as well as with uh, MPP Smith and MP Monsef, and they're very tuned in to what the issues are locally, um, and they're feeding that into the policy decisions that are being made at the provincial and federal level, and which it, is important. And, and you know this as well as anybody, Diane, during uh, quote unquote normal times, uh, politics enters a lot of issues and sometimes is a, a, many times is a hindrance to getting things done uh, the way certain parties would like to see them done. <clears throat> it seems everybody seems to be pulling the oars at the same time right now. Um, and, and it's kind of refreshing. I, I mean, it's almost like, you know, it, you have to, right? I mean, otherwise yeah. we're, we're just not going to come out on the other side. You know, as I've said before, I like municipal politics because it's, you know, supposed to be nonpartisan and we should all be working in the interest of the community anyways. Um, but I know that party lines, you know, get involved uh, here and there, but it has been very, uh, there's been a very cohesive effort um, that I've seen in terms of working with, you know, our, our conservative provincial member and our liberal federal member, uh, and then all the folks in the county and the city who have various, you know, potential alliances sort of behind the scenes or, you know, different colors that they normally would vote for. But um, that to me is, it's been good that everybody sort of put that aside and said, well, how do we focus on, um, and when we talk about prosperity, not just like financial and economic, but that um, mental health and well-being and the physical well-being and the, you know, the um, community connection that so many people are are lacking right now and particularly kids I know my little nephew who's two and a half who doesn't understand why he can't go to daycare and see his friends and and they're too young to understand that and so yeah. there's going to be there's impacts there as well and then you know then there's a whole different sort of set of it for those of us that are old enough to know and understand but still are really feeling the you know isolation piece and uh, maybe very quickly, I just get a comment from you because I, I do think it's it's worth repeating. We we are gaining a new appreciation for certain professions that that sometimes uh, we malign a little too much during normal times. Uh, healthcare workers, um, grocery store workers, um, you know, uh, th th these people that uh, that do these jobs and do them well and do them without thanks are really getting us through this. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we know, you know, you know, you hear a lot about, you know, doctors and nurses, and of course, you know, but it's also the folks that are, you know, working custodial jobs at the hospital, keeping things clean and sanitary, the folks that are serving food in our long term care facilities, um, who aren't normally the ones held up and they're, you know, not getting paid nearly what, what I, I believe they deserve to be paid. Um, you know, folks that are continuing to, as you said, work in those uh, outlets that fulfill our you know food needs our pharmacy needs um you know uh all of those things so it is uh you know all those people that are deemed essential workers that are going in every day you know certainly it's um there's been i think a, a rightful recognition of the work that they've been doing and, and putting themselves and their health and their family's health and well-being you know sort of on, on the line when they have to go in to work every day you're watching the Peterborough Matters with Mayor Diane Terrian. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Peterborough Matters. I, my name is Paul Rellinger. Uh, we're coming to you via Zoom uh, with uh, Mayor Diane Tarian, talking, of course, about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, the effect on the city, the effect on our, our municipal politicians uh, as they guide us through this situation. And I, I, I want to start uh, the second half here, uh, Diane, uh, just talking about the current situation regarding the numbers for for our area, which includes Peterborough City and County, Hiawatha and Curve Lake. Um, they were fairly stable, as you know, for the longest time heading into the late last week. I think there were around 51 positive cases uh, through, the, through the course of the pandemic, going up maybe one or two a day. We're sitting now, um, today, as of this uh, recording, we're sitting at 83. Uh, they went up quite a bit on the weekend by about 30. 
uh, huge jumps each day compared to what's happened in the past. Your thoughts on that? And uh, man, anybody who thought we were close to being out of this, th this is a real kick in the pants. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think, you know, there is a couple factors. One is that there's expanded testing. And so they're, you know, now testing anybody that has even mild symptoms. So that's perhaps one. Um, there was also concern about the Easter long weekend and folks that still decided to have, uh, you know, large family gatherings or travel out of town or, or, or not just practice that physical distancing that we were asking people to do. And so um, those are a couple of things that, uh, potentially, or, you know, we're leading to that increase in, in cases. Uh, it's, you know, also as the, as the weather is getting nicer and, you know, it's not as nice today, but yesterday was, you know, quite nice. And there were a couple of days where it was warm and sunny and people are more inclined to go out. And, uh, you know, and as far as I've seen when I'm out walking the dogs or just out in the neighborhood, people are very good about maintaining that distance. But I have heard like I've been avoiding, you know, the trails and that kind of thing because I have heard that they're they get quite crowded, uh, and that people aren't necessarily always abiding by that physical distancing piece. So, um, and it's it's tough too because the numbers, as you said, were stable for a while, and so people in their minds, you know, it's really easy to think, oh well, the numbers are stable, so we're good. Yeah. Uh, but we've been trying to hammer home that message that well, we need those numbers to remain stable for longer than just a week or so. Uh, because otherwise you just get right back into it. And so, um, you know, hopefully the upside or the silver lining of the increase that we've seen is that people, you know, kind of uh, take that to heart again. And, uh, you know, we're looking at uh, really nice weather this upcoming weekend. Um, and so as tempting as it is to want to have some people over to hang out on the porch or whatever, or meet in the park, like, we're just kind of saying, it's it's really hard. I get that, um, but the the longer that we're able to maintain this, the sooner we'll be able to get out of it. And if we don't act that way now, we're going to be in it for a longer period of time. And you bring up a good point. It's kind of a double edged sword. If if this pandemic had happened in winter, how depressing would that be to be stuck in your house? And <laughs> it's cold. Uh, but, but everybody stays at home in the winter anyways. So exactly, it arguably right, would be right. better. Like it would just be the excuse to be able to hibernate and not have to talk to anybody. <laughs> it, it, no, you make a good point. But, uh, <laughs> but the, very, the very fact that we're coming up on the cusp of, uh, of May, uh, heading into June, uh, the weather is going to get much better. And that's really the big challenge. Uh, people are stir crazy. And, and uh, you know what? The, through this whole process, it's really been, we're relying on people's, common sense and good judgment it's it's almost impossible to enforce let's face it i mean you can put sure. signs in you can do all you want uh in terms of, of of you know kind of governing this um but you're really really relying on people's good faith yeah absolutely and you know there have been you know uh i've gotten emails from people concerned about a group hanging out at this park or uh we know a couple weeks ago there was the the story about the the men playing basketball that got fined um, but if somebody's having people over to their private residence, um, that's, you know, it, it's, it is, it's impossible to enforce. And so, um, you know, we find, you know, cause we've had these conversations on the calls I've been on, um, with County, you know, representatives who, you know, have a whole sort of other layer of concern around, uh, cottagers and that kind of thing, um, where, we feel like at this point, it's pretty much impossible for people not to know what's going on and not have heard these messages. Um, but again, there's always, you know, other circumstances going on and, and you can't control everybody's behavior. Um, mm -hmm. But we've just been trying to, again, relay the point that, you know, the, the, the more uh, strict we are about this right now in terms of policing our own behaviors and, and abiding by that physical distancing, the sooner we'll be able to hopefully lift the you know state of emergency and reopen some things uh and if people aren't doing that then they're kind of ruining it for everyone right yeah, no for sure and uh it's the old uh you know short-term pain for long-term gain sort of thing yeah I suppose. um last night at city council uh, a number of items on the agenda i want to talk about one in particular uh that is covid related more or less um and the need uh, as city council sees it uh, for the province to step up with more funding for long-term care homes uh, in, in the region. 
Um, can you talk about that? Uh, where's that coming from? And uh, uh, are you hopeful that that request will be heard? Yeah, so that's a, it was a motion brought forward by Councillor Keith Riel, who has been on the board of Fairhaven for several years and has been a, a staunch advocate for uh, the residents there. Um, and that's the municipally owned facility. And there's several other long-term care facilities in the community um, that have and I remember this from when I was first on council, you know, Councillor Riel, whenever our member of provincial parliament would come, would just hammer them on funding for long-term care. So this isn't a new problem. Uh, this is something that has been building up over the years and that the, you know, the amount that's tied to uh, individual and in the long-term care facility has been fixed for quite a while and it hasn't kept pace with either inflation or the cost of you know, food and the, and all of those other rising costs. And so, you know, we know that as well, uh, you know, a huge amount, a vast majority of, of cases and deaths that we're seeing from COVID are happening in long-term care facilities, not just in Peterborough City County, but across the, the country. Uh, and, you know, we hear about our neighbors in Bob Cajun and what happened, you know, at Pinecrest. And we know that there's been some outbreaks at institutions in Peterborough. Um, and again, you have these you know the workers that are working there are these ones that are seldom publicly celebrated that aren't uh paid you know as much as a lot of their counterparts in other um healthcare fields but are providing a really essential service and um these are you know really vulnerable residents um that are are in there and because they don't have you know family there necessarily to advocate for them and because things have been closed now you know visitors and all of that um, it's a really difficult situation. So we need to advocate for uh, an increase in funding to help provide for these, these people that are in these long-term care facilities um, who deserve to have good care and deserve to be safe. Uh, and so I know that this has been flagged with uh, MPP Smith and um, he's you know, bringing it forward. And I know that they're hearing about it, not just in Peterborough, but across Ontario. Having said that, I guess the big challenge, as you know, coming out of this, um, government at all levels is going to be strapped to provide the same level of funding we're seeing now. Uh, yeah. you know, there, there's been money provided, and rightly so, to help people get through this time. We're talking millions, billions of dollars uh, across the country. Um, so I, I, I think you should, I agree, you should go after it and, and, and mon any money that is out there. But again, they're going to be they're going to be really hard pressed to to provide anything additional to what we're seeing right now. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> when you see the some of the you know uh, subsidies that the federal government puts towards different industries, you know, oil and gas and those kinds of things, you know that the money is there. It's just a question of allocation. And so, of course, long term care, healthcare is provincial, um, and I know that they've been really looking hard at how they can ensure that things are being e equitably distributed. Um, so I, I understand 100% the challenges are, are tough. We know that municipally, you know, we've had this, uh, again, lost revenue from closed facilities, deferral of property taxes, because we're trying to help residents get through this. But then that is going to come back to the municipality to try to figure out the budget. And then that does go up through the other levels of government. Um, but I think, you know, anytime there's been some of these major disasters, pandemics, you know, um, crises in the in the country, uh, there, you know, it is sort of, it does fall to the higher levels of government to provide that infusion to you not know, just kickstart the economy, but make sure that its residents are looked after. And so I believe that long-term care, you know, this is a, again, like I said, this is a problem that isn't new. This is a problem that, you know, should have been rectified 10 years ago. Um, and so that is certainly, uh, you know, there is a, a gap there that they should be making up for. Um, you brought it up earlier that uh, the Premier was, I believe, on TV yesterday, uh, commenting on, he didn't provide a timeline, but he provided a rough <clears throat> outline of a, of a plan, I guess, for starting to slowly reopen something right. at some point. Um, having seen that, and, and obviously you know our situation here in Peterborough better than anybody. Uh, I won't ask you to provide a timeline because that's totally unfair. Nobody knows at this point. But um, take us behind the scenes a little bit. Are, are there talks around a plan of action? Uh, you don't have to be specific because I know that's hard to do. 
Um, but is there a plan of action that at least has been started? Yeah, so I mean, we announced the other, uh, <laughs> the days are blending together, although April's going by faster than March did. Um, but we did announce that municipal facilities would remain closed throughout May. Uh, and so that is sort of, you know, the provincial state of emergency, um, it, you know, the date is earlier in May, but then they reevaluate. And in their plan, they talked about reevaluating every two and then four weeks. Um, and so at least it provides a bit of a, uh, a timeline, not a specific date, but a window um, for them to kind of look and see if the cases uh, that are traced to a source have been have been dropping that they'll then, you know, lay out the framework for reopening those facilities. And so, um, you know, we, you know, our local state of emergency and our decisions are tied quite closely to the, what the province uh, is doing, even though we do have a different situation than other um, municipalities across the province. Some of the bigger ones, more urban centers, obviously higher cases. Some of the more northern communities, not so much. Uh, we're kind of in the middle a little bit. But again, we want to make sure that we're doing things in the most responsible, safe way for all of our residents, but also recognizing that people are really keen to um, know whether or not they're going to have a, you know, a soccer season this year or if their kids are going to be able to, you know, play uh, football. So we're trying to figure all of those things out. Mm -hmm. um, and you got you events know, like Music Fest and... Well, and that's the other thing. So, you know, like the city of Toronto said no events until the end of June. Uh, we haven't made that kind of declaration yet. We don't necessarily have as many as a big city like Toronto does in, in the month of June, but Music mm -hmm. Fest, absolutely. You know, Folk Fest, um, the various downtown festivals that happen throughout the summer. Uh, there, I know that some, uh, you know, the Taste of Downtown has already been cancelled. Um, that happens in early June. There's others that are sort of up in the air. They and this is the really difficult part is that we don't know, the province doesn't know, the federal government doesn't know whether or not we're going to be able to say something in mid-July gets the go-ahead or not. And so organizers don't want to full out pull the plug on it, but they also don't want to be putting, you know, a bunch of money down if the event isn't going to go through. So it's really a tough situation for sure. Um, well, Diane, we appreciate your candor. This is a tough time for everybody. Uh, you've been watching Peterborough Matters. Our plan is to join uh, you weekly, and uh, we'll look forward to that, and, uh, and uh, we'll just kind of have to see where this goes. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.